Hey everyone, this is Pastor Steve Feinstein from Sovereign Way Christian Church. And I figure given that we are in this situation where we're all sheltering in place and we are unable to um, come together for fellowship, I figured it would be good if I just did some short videos every now and again um, talking about matters of theology, matters of, of the Bible. And so one thing that my wife has uh, long complained about is all of my books. Um, she's like, you haven't even come close to reading all of them. And you know what? She's right. There's a lot of them that I haven't read. So I figure during this time, this would be perfect for me maybe to read a couple of them each week and, um, you know, make some uh, some commentary on it. And so the first one I'm starting with is Al Mohler's book, He Is Not Silent, which is a great book about preaching. And I've already read the first chapter, and I'm really impressed. And so I figure we could all uh, gain something out of this. So what I will do is I'll just summarize some of the, the main teaching points um, from this book and from the chapter that I read today. And hopefully tomorrow I'll have some more chapters read and can do this again. So anyway, uh, Dr. Moeller's main point in this is that as we're preaching in a postmodern world, we have to have, I guess you could say, worship right. If our worship isn't right, then our preaching isn't going to be right. And you know, the problem is in our particular culture, people tend to think of worship as only music. Like worship is when we sing to the Lord. But if you look up what worship is in the Bible, if you even think of what the word means, like in English, the word is the combination of two words in Old, in old English, worth-ship, meaning the one who we worship, we worship him because he's worthy. It's all about the object of the worship rather than um, the, the how. You know, it's, it, who are we worshiping? When you look at the, the Greek New Testament, the word worship means to bow down. So it really ultimately has nothing to do with singing. I guess you could say singing is an expression of how we worship God, and it's definitely a biblical expression, but it, it's far more than that. See, the problem is in evangelical churches today, most people go to church hoping to be entertained, hoping to have their felt needs met by whatever that worship service is going to do. But God is the audience, right? God is the audience. He's the one that we're coming to worship. And the way we are to worship him, Jesus made it clear in John chapter 4. We are to worship him in spirit and truth. And the probably, not probably, the centerpiece of any given worship service, corporately speaking, is going to be the sermon. It's going to be the word of God because, again, you have to understand what worship is. And so what Dr. Moeller does is he brings us to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And so I'm going to read it, and I'm going to briefly comment on it and make some of the same points that, that Dr. Moeller made. And so and just to let you know, I'll be reading from the Tree of Life version, which is a Messianic Jewish uh, version of the Bible. I really enjoy this. Now, at our church, we, we preach from the Christian Standard Bible or the ESV. We, uh, we go back and forth on those. This isn't what I preach from, but I, I really, just from my personal reading, I, I enjoy the Tree of Life version. So I'll be reading from that right here. So Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. We're going to learn a lot about what true worship is, and then this will tell you what, what you should expect out of church service, and specifically what you should expect out of preaching. So starting in Isaiah chapter 6, you could say this is the beginning of Isaiah's ministry, the call. It says this, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw Adonai sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Adonai Sabaot, or the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now I want to stop there for a second, right? Isaiah is put in this state where he is able to get a glimpse or a vision of God. And when he sees God, he only sees a fraction of God's glory. And then he has these angels telling them exactly who this God is. Holy, holy, holy. Now in the ancient Hebrew, if you're going to say holy, holier, holiest, you're going to say holy, holy, holy. You're going to say it three times. What these angels are saying is there's nobody like God. He is the most holy being in all of existence. He is, there, there's nobody else like him. The, I mean, these angels, when you read in other places, they're terrified of God. They're covering their eyes. Um, that's who God is. And so Isaiah, he's heard of God, but now he's getting a glimpse of God. And he's, he's learning about who this God 
is and he's seeing what the worship of this God looks like in heaven. It's God's angels recognizing his holiness. Now I want you to see how this affects Isaiah. When we read on, it says, Then the posts of the door trembled at the voice of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Oy to me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I am dwelling among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, Adonai Savaot, or Lord, uh, the Lord of hosts. Right? So Isaiah sees God. He sees God's holiness. And what is his first realization? I'm not holy. I have seen God. Woe is me. I'm dead. I'm a dead man. And see, when we worship God, when we come before God, every time we get this vision of God, right? When we understand and see who God is, this should be the response. He's holy. I'm not. He's all powerful. I'm not. He's perfect. I'm not. I deserve judgment. Woe is me. I am a sinner, right? That is what seeing God and seeing the truth of who God is, that's what it did to Isaiah. And I'm telling you, this is what true worship's about. Seeing God for who he is. So first, what do we see about God? And then what do we see about man? God's holy, we're not, woe is us. But that's not where it stops, okay? If you keep reading in verse six, it then says, one of the seraphim flew to me with a glowing coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sins atoned for. You notice that? So this points forward to ultimate atonement that's going to come through Christ Jesus. But, but notice what happened here. Isaiah sees God, right? That's what all worship services are meant to get us to do. Picture God as he is. Then Isaiah sees himself. I have great need. I'm a sinner. I'm undone. And then what does God do? He answers that need. He atones for Isaiah's sin. Okay? So we see who God is. We realize our own sin. And then we recognize that we cannot save ourselves. We cannot atone for ourselves. There is nothing Isaiah did here. It was all from God alone. God sent the angel who atoned in this case for Isaiah in that moment. But think about it. We come before God, we see our sin, and we can do nothing to make our sins go away. We could do nothing to earn forgiveness. And so what we see is the need for atonement and that God and God alone provides that atonement. He's the one who makes us clean. He's the one who makes our sins go away. So then we can have a relationship with this one who is holy, holy, holy. Our uncleanness no longer separates us from him when he is the one who makes atonement for us, when he is the one who forgives our sins. And so then the final point of what worship is comes from the result. You really think seeing God for who he is, seeing you for who you are, and then seeing that God has atoned for you if you believe on Christ, that's supposed to do nothing to you? No. It does something to you. Look at how it ends. It says, Then I heard the voice of Adonai saying, Whom should I send and who will go for us? So I said, Hineni, or here I am. In Hebrew, he said, Send me. Right? So God atones for him. Then God asks the question that he knows the answer to. Who should I send to the people to, to preach the word? And Isaiah said, Send me. Okay, when you worship God properly, you are seeing God for who he is. You realize what you are, a sinner. You then come to Christ who saves you by grace. And then you listen to Christ who says, go. Go into every nation, tribe, and tongue. We are his spokespeople. We are those who, who speak his word to, to those who are lost. True salvation requires a response from us. Right? We're not just supposed to sit here doing nothing. It requires a response. So let's take all of this, everything that we just saw in this, in this, this quick breakdown of Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. What should you see in a, a church worship service? Well, first, whatever we're doing should be pointing us to God. And every time you open the word of God, this is his inspired word to us. If it is properly being taught and explained, you are learning and seeing more of God in his word. And when you see God within that worship service, you're also supposed to realize you're a sinner. There should be confession of your sin before God Almighty. There should be a corporate confession of our sin. But then there should be the reminder of atonement. 
which is the gospel. Any worship service that's devoid of the gospel is not a worship service. Okay, God had to atone for us in order for us to have this relationship with him, in order for us to be his people. So in a church service, you should have the word of God being proclaimed. You should have people convicted by that word. There should be the gospel on every, you know, the, 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 every page of the scripture points to the gospel. And so we should be seeing that and marveling at our Messiah who saves us. And then it should always end with, so what? What now, Christian? In light of who God is and what he has done to save us, in light of what this text has shown us about God, in light of what how this text showed us we needed Jesus, showed us we needed the gospel, in light of all that, what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to say, okay, God, I will go. Send me whatever it is you're commanding from this passage. I will be the one to do it. Now, I'm telling you, if that's what worship of God is, it's not going to be accomplished just by singing. It's going to be the whole worship service, and the centerpiece is going to be the Word of God. So we need to be people of the Word. We need to be focusing on the Word. We need to, in everything we do when we're reading the Scripture, see God more and more for who He is so that we will appreciate and love Him and adore Him for the Gospel and then be fired up to do the works that He's called us to.